Hello class, um, welcome to the week four part of the pre-lab video where we'll talk a little bit about the activity essay that you'll be running as part of this week's lab. So um, last week for week three we did our Bradford assay which looked at the total amount of protein in each of our samples and now we're going to do this activity assay where we are specifically measuring the activity of LDH and its ability to catalyze a reaction. So what reaction is that? It's not actually written here but it is the reaction NADH plus pyruvate makes NAD plus and lactate. And LDH helps to catalyze this reaction. So um, the more LDH you have in any given sample, the faster that reaction is going to occur, right? If you have more LDH, it's able to eat up more substrate and ultimately make more product more quickly. And so we can monitor our reaction by using this decrease in NADH concentration that we see at 340 nanometers. So 340 nanometers is a really good place for us to measure the consumption of NADH because NADH has a nice peak in absorbance around 340 nanometers, whereas NAD plus, the product, does not absorb strongly at 340. Um, so that's why we choose 340 nanometers as what we measure um, instead of something like maybe this 260, um, because at 260 we see both our product and our reactions reactants uh, absorb strongly here. So you wouldn't see the consumption of NADH as it turns into NAD plus because when you use up an NADH and you make that into an NAD+, you'd still see a strong absorbance here. Whereas here, if you use up an NADH and it turns into NAD+, you go from having a high absorbance at that location to no absorbance for every, every molecule that you absorb. So essentially, when we look at the wavelength at 340 nanometers, we're going to measure that over time for our activity assay, which we see on our bottom graph here. So here, our y-axis is our absorbance at 340 which we're looking at, and then our x-axis is going to be time. So over what we're, what we're really interested in measuring here is the initial rate of our reaction. So our initial rate of our reaction will tell us how much NADH we're consuming at the very beginning um, when all of our LDH is active and catalyzing the NADH that we put into the tube. So um, we, in an ideal world, we would see a very sort of straight line here that indicates our consumption of substrate um, at a particular speed. Um, but really what we see in real life is usually more of this gentle curve shape where at the beginning of the reaction goes faster. And then as substrate begins to be used up, the reaction goes more slowly over time. So it's really important to measure that initial velocity, that V naught, that's towards the beginning of our reaction. So some practical tips for running the activity assay. Um, we want to, we're again running this in a spectrophotometer, right? We're measuring an absorbance at 340 nanometers over time. So the way we'll do this in order to best capture the activity of our LDH enzyme is first we'll place our reaction buffer in the cuvette, which contains the substrate and some other things to help make the environment more friendly for your LDH. And after that, then you'll add your sample, which either contains LDH or doesn't contain LDH into that cuvette. And really, really important here is you want to mix quickly, but also thoroughly. So um, you want to mix quickly because the reaction, as soon as you put together that LDH and that substrate, that reaction is going to start happening. So you want to mix quickly so you can get that cuvette into the sector photometer as soon as possible. So you can get a really accurate reading for that initial velocity. Because as we saw in the previous slide, over time that reaction rate slows down. And so you might get a worse estimate of how much LDH you have if you wait too long in between mixing together the sample and the buffer and actually reading it in the sector photometer. Um, you also still want to mix it thoroughly. Um, even though you're going quickly, it's very important to be thorough because if you have uneven places where everything is not mixed together homogeneously, you might get pockets in the cubet where a reaction is happening faster and pockets where it's happening slower. You might get air bubbles. Um, all of these things can affect the reading you get and make it more inaccurate. 
So the way you can mix it can be just like you mixed for your Bradford assay. You can either use the pipette tip from a pipette man and gently pipette up and down, or you can use that same pipette tip to just stir inside the cuvette. And a third option you also have is to cut a small piece of parafilm, cover the top of the cuvette, and invert the whole thing a few times. But um, you want to be very careful with any of these three techniques that you do to not introduce air bubbles and not to spill your sample. Um, so I recommend maybe trying it out on, uh, trying out the mixing maybe on one of your samples where maybe you're not expecting to have too much LDH just to get the hang of it, maybe in one of your, your washes, for example. Um, so at any rate, once you have your sample in your cuvette and it's mixed both thoroughly and quickly, you'll place it into the spectrophotometer. And you'll want to place it, again, make sure that the path of light is able to go through the clear parts of the cuvette. So the way this one is set up, the light is going to go in that direction where I just drew the arrow. So make sure that if you have a cuvette with cloudy sides and a cuvette with clear sides, that the clear sides are what allow the light to pass through and the cloudy sides are the opposite. Um, so once you place the cuvette into the spectrophotometer, you can then close the cover. This will just slide forward and then begin the measurement. And you'll start measuring at 340 nanometers over time. And again, you'll get a separate sheet in the lab of how to actually operate the spectrophotometer. So what are some of the results that you might see? So if you have a high concentration of LDH, you will probably see a curve that looks sort of similar to what I've been showing you, where it starts out fairly high, you start out with this fairly steep, steep slope, and then over time it sort of levels out. So if you have any kind of sort of more steep curve that transitions into a more gently sloping curve, that is a pretty good readout that can give you a pretty accurate reading for your LDH, and you again just want to measure that initial velocity as best as you can. Um, and something else that you might see if you have a fairly low LDH concentration is you might see a graph that has a similar shape, um, but the, the computer software will automatically sort of zoom in. Um, and so you'll, you'll see what looks like noise, but is in fact just there because you're zoomed in so close. So you might, you'll still see the same sort of reaction shape, except you might see more noisiness to that gentle slope. Um, but as long as you have a gentle slope and you have sort of something you can measure as that initial velocity, then that is perfectly sufficient. Um, something to watch out for, in some of your samples, you might not have any LDH, and in fact that's expected for some of your samples, right? So something like your, your wash or some of your later elutions, um, some of, even from your... Uh, I forget what else, but yeah, some, some of your samples, certainly you're not expecting to have a lot of LDH. Um, and so there you will see what is essentially just a line that goes straight across, because you're not consuming that NADH substrate over time. And so you'll see a fairly um, constant reading of your absorbance at 340 nanometers, except it will still be a pretty low reading. And so again, the computer is going to zoom in, and so you'll see some very noisy data that might go sort of up and down or oscillate, but overall you'll still see that it sort of essentially traces a straight line that goes straight across. So as long as you have essentially like a trend in your data, um, that is a perfectly acceptable reading. That's just showing you you have no LDH in that sample. Um, and so the last thing you might expect to see is if you need to actually remix your sample. Um, you might There might be the case where you have bubbles in your cubet, which would alter the reading in a way that makes you unable to get an accurate reading. Or if you just didn't um, mix your sample well enough, you'll have, again, those pockets where you have some areas with a lot of LDH, some with a little, some areas with a lot of substrate, some areas with a little. And so you'll get, you could get a whole variety of readings that for whatever reason are readable or not readable. So you might get a really confusing reading that's sort of all over the place. So if you see something, you know, like this, this doesn't tell you a lot, um, so this is unhelpful. That means you probably have bubbles in there or some some other issue, and so you'll just you'll just have to remix that sample and measure it again. Um, but every once in a while, you might get maybe a small bubble that's affecting your sample, but only a little bit. Um, so you may have something that looks maybe more like that. And if that's the case, this is still actually fairly readable. Um, so you want to ignore this sort of weird part that is an outlier, but um, 
this data before that funny little bubble or this data after this little bubble is still fairly linear. And so that data you can absolutely use to calculate the, the slope of your line to get your initial velocity. So just to put everything together, um, from last week we did our Bradford assay. This helped us measure our total protein concentration and we got our concentration of protein in micrograms per mil. This week we are doing the activity assay. The activity assay is giving us the concentration of enzymatically active LDH, so it specifically measures just our protein that we're trying to isolate. And the units that we measure LDH in are called units. So the activity of an enzyme is referred to as units, and it's a little bit confusing. Um, so our readout of this is ultimately going to be in units of LDH per ml. So ultimately what we're going to be calculating um, for, your, for your lab reports is the specific activity of LDH, in which is an indicator of the purity of our protein. And so the specific activity, we're going to measure the units of LDH that we measured from our activity assay and divide that by the milligrams of total protein that we measured with our Bradford assay. And so when we have this units of enzymatically active protein per milligram, that's what we refer to as the specific activity. So the more units we have per total protein, the more pure our sample of LDH is going to be. So in summary, just to wrap everything up, after weeks three and four, we're going to have analyzed all of the samples that you collected from weeks one and two, and you'll have done that using an activity assay, which detects LDH, and a Bradford assay, which detects all the proteins in, all the in each sample. And finally, next week, we'll wrap this up by performing gel electrophoresis, and we're going to do that using some selected samples from weeks one and two and use them to visualize any LDH and any contaminant proteins, and we'll be able to see what their molecular weights are. So this is a really important reminder to not throw away your samples after you're done this week, because you will need them to finish up in week five. So that being said, now you're ready to answer the pre-lab question and get on with the rest of the lab.